Um, so I start by thanking um, uh, Sipul very much for hosting me today. It's been a great morning and I hope um, we can maintain the energy through the afternoon. Um, I only got here on Wednesday, so if I can stay awake, then everyone else can. <laughs> Good for you. Um, so I've taken the topic that I was given for today, the common law of IP, uh, fairly literally and also fairly broadly. So I chose my title, Looking Out and Looking In, as a nod to how Australian lawyers uh, see the common law and their relationship with the jurisdiction from whence it came, but also um, as a nod to how expats, of whom Bill was one, and I was once, and, and many of you in the audience also are, experience life in their new homes. So no matter how fully integrated you are, the perspective is always a little detached. So having chosen the title, the case on which I thought I would hang my presentation flowed naturally. So it's one that allows me to start from the main interest that Bill and I had in common, the history, the legal history and the history of IP. So when I applied to do my postgraduate study at Cambridge, I proposed a thesis topic in copyright history. And it must have been that that piqued Bill's interest because I can't imagine that the pro proposal itself was much better than average. But I'll always be grateful that he agreed to supervise my PhD and to support me because it set me on the path of a career that I still love. And it also allows me to draw out some other themes from Bill's scholarship brought together in, in the books that we've talked about already and also in the 2003 Clarendon lectures. And these lectures conclude by noting that a continuous thread throughout the lectures is that any freedom to compete should remain the norm from which any argument for a special case has to be made. So on that note, let's wind the clocks back to Sydney in the 1930s. So Victoria Park Racecourse was a racecourse in Zetland, now an inner city suburb of Sydney. Originally a swamp, it was drained in the early 1900s to build the racecourse, which was used from 1908 for pony racing. It was one of a number of proprietary racecourses, the significance of which was being able to determine the type of betting that could occur and the people who could attend. So Cyril Angles was a popular sporting commentator employed by Sydney radio station 2UW. His commentary was apparently incisive and unhurried, delivered in a flat, mechanical and slightly abrasive voice. Surprisingly, given this description, by 1945, his popularity had made him the highest paid broadcaster in Australia. But back in the 1930s, he was not popular with racecourse proprietors. Perceiving that trackside commentary was affecting attendance, the racecourse proprietors banned him from their courses and altered the race tickets, turning them into contracts which prohibited anyone from communicating race results to anyone off the course until five minutes after the last race had taken place. Angles responded um, with a range of innovative solutions, including covering events from the laundry of a flat overlooking the Kensington racetrack, um, from the flatbed of a ute um, next to an, another racetrack in Sydney. Is ute, is that an Australian people? You know, Do what, what is the English word for ute? Like a, a utility truck? <laughs> Um, and from a spot in the branches of a Morton Bay fig tree next to Warwick Farm Track, so Australian. Um, in flat and marshy Zetland, the owners of Victoria Park erected fences of up to 11 feet high. But across the road from Victoria Park was George Taylor's cottage. I'm so happy I found this image of George Taylor's house because it is identical to my house <laughs> that I live in now, except a mirror image. The judge, I have to say, rather dismissively referred to it as a suburban bungalow. <laughs> Nowadays, I think we would call it a federation cottage with period features. <laughs> anyway, on the lawn in front of his cottage, um, 2UW and Angles erected an observation tower, about 16 feet high. And from the platform, it was possible to see the whole of the racing tracks, the notice board on which the names of the horses and their starting positions were displayed the winning post, the judge's box, and a semaphore on which the numbers of the placed horses were posted. Angles would stand on the platform and using field glasses, as they called them in the case, would observe the races and provide a contemporaneous commentary. This was simultaneously broadcast to the public 
and mixed with advertisements to considerable popular acclaim. Taylor received a fee of one pound on each occasion that the platform was used. Victoria Park Racing was not happy, but what could they do? As is well known, what they did do was seek a perpetual injunction against Taylor, Angles and 2UW, seeking to restrain them from using the land and making the broadcast. As is also well known, they did not succeed. But they did give rise to a case that has become one of Australia's landmark cases in IP for what it didn't do as much as for what it did. And its tentacles reach into pre the present day in the law of IP and also of nuisance. It was cited and discussed by the UK Supreme Court only last month in Fern and the trustees of the Tate Gallery. Um, of course, it's the IP tentacles that I'm interested in today. But the relationship between the two is of interest because one of the key tensions in intellectual property law is the binary between the physical and the immaterial, the tangible and the intangible, how the rights to the physical property intersect with rights to the use that one can make of it. The dissenting judgment of Lord Sales in the Tate Gallery case considered the way that nuisance cases slide into privacy cases, while Lord Leggett pointed out that Victoria Park was not one of nuisance caused by visual intrusion. Rather, as Justice Dixon pointed out in Victoria Park, the substance of the plaintiff's complaint goes to interference not with its enjoyment of the land, but with the profitable conduct of its business. So in Victoria Park, the question arose, if not nuisance, could this wrong be captured by intellectual property law? So as Bill wrote in the preface to the first edition of his book that we've already looked at a few times today, the right to prevent others from using ideas or information to their own advantage is not easily delineated. Legal techniques of some sophistication are called for. And the techniques of the common law are what I'm focusing on today, but of course, as we shall see, different lawyers applying these same techniques may end up in very different places. So in Victoria Park, the majority judges took a legalistic approach to delineate the scope of the right sought by the plaintiff. Chief Justice Latham pointed out the court hadn't been referred to any authority or principle of law which prevents any man from describing anything which he sees anywhere if he doesn't make defamatory statements, infringe the law as to offensive language, etc., or wrongfully reveal confidential information. He rejected the argument that the law recognises a right of privacy, stating that however desirable some limitations upon invasion of privacy might be, no authority was cited to show that any such right existed. Um, and finally, in relation to copyright, he noted the law of copyright doesn't give any person any exclusive right to describe particular facts. So in agreement um, with Chief Justice Latham was Justice Dixon, perhaps the most respected of all Australia's High Court judges and a strong proponent of the common law method. Um, in a speech delivered at Yale, he wrote that while the judges of Australia were now guided rather than governed by the courts in London, when their own conceptions of the principles of common law constrained them to depart from modern English precedent, it is done with reluctance and regret. In Victoria Park, Justice Dixon steered away from recent developments in both English law and US law. Where dissenting judges, uh, Rich, Justices Rich and Evert, drew on the recently decided case of Donoghue and Stevenson, to develop the law of nuisance uh, and find they would have found in favour of Victoria Park. Justice Dixon took uh, an oblique swipe at that case, stating, the law of tort has fallen into great confusion. He likewise resisted any invitation to travel down the route recently taken by the US, or not that recently, but more recently than now, the US Supreme Court and International News Service and Associated Press, giving a quasi property right in news, preferring the more Anglo-centric approach taken by Justice Brandeis in dissent. So Justice Dixon famously rejected the quasi proprietary approach, stating that courts of equity, um, it's on the quote on the slide, have not in British jurisdictions thrown the protection of an injunction around all the intangible elements of value. That is value in exchange, which may flow from the exercise by an individual of his powers or resources, whether in the organization of business or undertaking or the use of ingenuity, knowledge, skill, or labor. He went on to say that this was sufficiently evidenced by the history of the law of copyright and by the fact that the exclusive right to invention, trademark, designs, trade name, and reputation are dealt with in English law under special heads of protected interests and not under a wide generalization. So this was still the case in 1981 when the first edition of Cornish on intellectual property appeared, and it remains the case today. 
But courts of law and equity have, in the meantime, been asked many times to throw their protection around quite a few more intangible elements of value. So I'm turning now to explore the common law legacy of Victoria Park into two fields of IP in Australia and UK. So passing off and breach of confidence slash privacy. <clears throat> so in Victoria Park, the dissenting judges, Justice Everett and Justice Rich, took the view um, that finding Taylor had engaged in a nuisance was merely an extension of the law, which took into account altering social conditions and standards. And Victoria Park was entitled to redress by the application of principles embodied in the common law. Justice Everett took a similar approach 23 years later when now Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New South Wales, he presided over the case of Henderson and Radio Corp. So there he found that the ballroom dancers, as you can see on the screen, were entitled to recover in passing off when the image was placed upon a record sleeve. Criticising the UK decision of McCulloch and May and its use of the common field of activity doctrine to restrict relief. Chief Justice Evatt held that the appellant has appropriated the professional reputation of the respondents for his own commercial ends and that this wrongful appropriation was an injury in itself. The reputation was a form of property and could be protected by an injunction. Subsequent high courts didn't see this case as being at odds with Victoria Park Racing. This is just a gratuitous picture, really. In 1984, in Moorgate, Tobacco and Philip Morris, a case involving license agreements over cigarette trademarks, the court observed that the rejection of a general action for unfair competition did not prevent the adaptation of the traditional doctrine of passing off to meet new circumstances, citing as examples the case of Henderson and also Warning and Townend. For Justice Dean, writing for the court, the problem with the action of unfair competition was that its main characteristic was the scope it allows under high sounding generalizations for judicial indulgence of idiosyncratic notions of what is fair in the marketplace. So it wasn't until 2002 that the specific question of false endorsement was considered by a UK court. And in that year, Justice Letty relied heavily on Henderson to find in favor of Eddie Irvine in his claim against talk radio. And by the time of Fenty and Arcadia Group in 2013, the action had been aligned with character merchandising and was unexceptional. But the UK courts have been less willing to follow Australia in a second expansion of goodwill, um, which I think uh, Jennifer touched on earlier, the situation where the plaintiff is not operating a business within the jurisdiction, but nonetheless has a reputation there. So in the 1992 case of Conagra and McCain, um, the uh, Justice Lockhart, um, having carried out an extensive review of English and Australian case law, was confident that it was quite wrong to assert that the law of passing off cannot protect a plaintiff or his goods in a country where he does not carry on business. So in asserting this, Justice Lockhart took notice of modern mass advertising, international mobility of persons, and enormous commercial enterprises, which he said, some with budgets larger than so sovereign states. But in 2015, the House of Lords in Starbucks and British Sky Broadcasting refused to follow this approach. And Lord Newberger, writing for the court, reaffirmed that a claimant in a passing off claim must establish they have goodwill in the sense of a customer base in the jurisdiction. Accepting that it was open to the court to develop or even change the law in relation to a common law principle when it's become archaic or unsuited to current practices of beliefs or beliefs, he nevertheless thought that making such a change in that instance risked undermining legal certainty and considered it essential to guard a distinction between goodwill and mere reputation. So it's tempting to speculate that the distinction at the heart of the different approaches might lie in the distinction between a nation whose geographic location and economic structure require it to look out to its larger trading partners and one which looks in at itself as a center of global trade. Nations, businesses, and individuals have considerable interest in controlling how they're perceived. These interests aren't just commercial, and the interaction between the personal and the commercial is particularly pointed when it comes to privacy. So privacy was raised in the Henderson case by Justice Manning, who observed that the desire of some persons to bring within the field of tort actions, field of tort, actions which may be vulgar, offensive, humiliating, or embarrassing. But he cautioned it was one thing to discuss what one feels the law should be as a matter of social justice, it's an entirely thing to consider what rights arise according to the common law. Privacy was also raised in Victoria Park because it was a case about looking onto private property. 
and both the dissenting judges in Victoria Park predicted that the rise of television would have, have an impact on the issues before them, something which seems remarkably prescient considering television didn't become available in Australia for another 19 years. But in ABC and Lena Gay Meets, this prediction indeed came to pass when the High Court was required to consider a request for injunctive relief by a possum meat processing plant against the national broadcaster. So the ABC was seeking to air footage taken surreptitiously of possums being killed within the plant. Um, the, well, the, air, the footage um, was taken by animal welfare activists. Um, and Lena Gay Meets specifically invited the court to recognise a tort of invasion of privacy. The court refused to do so, um, giving different reasons for their refusal um, in separate judgments. Um, Chief Justice Gleeson took the view that the breach, the breach of confidence provided a sufficient remedy, so consideration of a tort of privacy was unnecessary. But Justices Gummo and Hain gave the issue the deepest consideration. They thought that Victoria Park didn't stand in the way of developing a tort of invasion of privacy. But the significance of that case, as well as Moorgate, lay in Justice Dixon and Justice Dean's preferable legal method. Um, they characterised this, um, um, sorry, Gummo and Haynes, rather than a search to identify the ingredients of a generally expressed wrong, the better course, as Justice Dean recognised, is to look to the development and adaptation of recognised forms of action to meet new situations and circumstances. They looked to other jurisdictions, including the UK, New Zealand, and in particular the US, but in the end decided it was not appropriate to develop a tort of privacy, because in this case it would be to the benefit of a corporation rather than an individual, and fell closer to the line of unfair competition than privacy per se. But Justices Gummo and Hain specifically stated they didn't wish to foreclose any debate on an emergent tort of privacy, and Justice Callanan went still further. In his judgment, he condemned the majority in Victoria Park as being conservative and anachronistic even by the standards of 1937, preferring what he called the worldly approach of Justice Rich. Um, he thought the time was now ripe for a tort of invasion of privacy. Um, indeed, he also thought the time was approaching for the recognition of property in a spectacle. So the latter invitation remains to be taken up, but the former was accepted not in Australia, but in the UK here. So, as is well known, the House of Lords in Campbell and MGN desired derived considerable assistance from ABC and Lena Game Meets, in particular the judgment of Chief Justice Gleeson. Looking across the oceans, their Lordship considered his honours formulation of highly offensive to a reasonable person, but in the end adopted the lower standard of reasonable expectation of privacy. <coughs> Interestingly, the 20 years following ABC and Lena Game Meets haven't seen a similar development in Australia. But this might be about to change. Three years ago, in the case of Smithist and the Commissioner of Police, the High Court indicated it might have been open to arguments on developing a tort of invasion of privacy had submissions been made on the matter. Um, and in February of this year, the Attorney General's Department released um, its Privacy Act review, and one of their recommendations was the introduction, or is the introduction of a statutory tort of invasion of privacy based, as in the UK, um, on a person's reasonable expectation of privacy. And in making this recommendation, the Attorney General also noted the lack of development of the common law in the 20 years since Lena Game meets. So the section title of part one of the first edition of Cornish on intellectual property was Common Ground. So what I've tried to do today is draw out not only some of the common ground between the different forms of action that fall under the heading of IP, but also the common ground between Australia and UK IP law. So just as the claimants and defendants that I've been discussing look out at each other for purposes of profit, so too do common lawyers look across jurisdictions and across time to fashion the law of today. Claimants in particular continue to look for ways of using the common law methods to expand the law so that, and to quote again from Bill's Clarendon lectures, it's more and more the case that investment values are made the subject of exclusive protection. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. I simply can't resist putting a footnote to that, which is another illustration of Isabella's theme comes from another case about racing results, which is the racing partnership case, which was litigated in this country a few
years ago. And privacy was not relied upon in that case. The two main causes of action that were relied upon were misuse of confidential information and conspiracy to use unlawful means. And it shows how complicated this area of the law gets. So the first instance, Mr. Justice Zagaroni found that there was a misuse of confidential information, but he dismissed the conspiracy claim. When it got to the Court of Appeal, uh, I found that both torts were established. My colleague, Mr. Lord Justice Lewison, found that neither was established. Um, and Lord Justice Phillips agreed with me on unlawful means and with Lord Justice Lewison uh, on um, misuse of confidential information. So, in terms of the torts, we reversed the first instance. So there was success on unlawful means, but not misuse of confidential information by two to one in each case. But of course, the overall outcome was the same. Um, both parties got uh, permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, um, and then they settled their disputes the week before the hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Much to the frustration of lawyers and judges all around the country, who were rather looking forward to a definitive answer. But there we go. So, next up, we've got David Llewellyn from SMU. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, as I'm the person who Robin Jacob clearly referred to this morning, when he described Bill as not being very tall, but he towered over some others, and he looked, <laughs> and he looked up at me, um, I decided I'd better get out from behind, the, um, behind there, because you wouldn't be able to see me. Um, my title, which was given to me by Lionel, um, is Family Resemblances in IP Systems in the Commonwealth. Um, before going on to um, probably not deal with that, um, I would um, just like to say that Bill was uh, one of the three people who influenced my career the most. Uh, one of them uh, has fortunately gone because I'm going to abuse him a bit later, and that is Robin Jacob, and the third is Gerald Dworkin. And Gerald, back in 1979, said to me, David, would you like to go to the Max Planck Institute? And I said, what's the Max Planck Institute? No, I didn't really. I had studied intellectual property law at that time in my first law degree at Southampton with Gerald Dworkin, who used all of Bill's materials from his London LLM course. Um, but, uh, I said, yeah, I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. And he said, well, we'll go up to London to see Bill. So I went in to see Bill. And he said, what's your German like? And I said, well, I've got O-level German. And at that point, I first of all experienced something that nobody has yet mentioned, which is the Cornish snort. Um, <laughs> There is the Cornish raising of the eyebrow, but there was also the Cornish snort. And he snorted and said, well, the only word I knew when I left Adelaide was Riesling. Um, so I was in a, a decent position to take that forward. So I moved to Max Planck, where I went into the, uh, the British Referat, which was then uh, headed by Dieter Stauder, uh, and Hans Ulrich, who was on the, one of the versions of the program today, was in the next room, and along the corridor was Annette Kaur, um, and I went from there. I sat in the very seat that um, Bill had sat in for quite a long time when he was writing his book back in the 1970s. I arrived at the Institute on the 1st of January 1980, at the end of a decade where there had been the European Patent Convention, there'd been the Patents Act 1977 in this country, and Bill was writing about all of these things. So I, I went there. Um, as we all know, the book came out in 1981, and the next time I bumped into Bill was a few weeks after the publication of the book, and a day on which, unfortunately for my sins, I was then in articles at Linklater's, I'd written a short um, article about an early case in Australia called Apple Computer and Computer Edge um, about the protection of computer programs. And at the bottom of this article, and remember I was in articles at Linklater's at the time, I put the author specializes in intellectual property law. 
and I bumped into Bill and there was a snort. <laughs> and I said to him, what's the matter? And he said, have you read the Times today? And I said, no, I hate reading articles which I've written after I've sent them in. And he said, have a look at it. And at the bottom of that article were the words, the author specializes in property law. <laughs> at the time, in my articles, I was sitting in the property department. So this did not go down very well at all, but it was clear that the sub-editor at the Times had thought this is very arrogant and crossed out the word intellectual uh, and thought it was just about complicated leases or something like that. So this comes back to a point that Francis was mentioning this morning about the difficulty of this word intellectual in a country that looks down on intellectuals. Unlike Germany and France, where Geistiges or intellectuel is something to be looked up to. In this country, certainly in the 70s, it wasn't. And so this was something that really, let's keep that to the universities. Anyway, um, for this talk that I'm going to give, I took two of the words from the title um, of um, Bill's Clarendon Lectures. Distracting, irrelevant. And that's basically what I'm going to, uh, those are the two words which will sum, sum up what I'm going to speak about for the next few minutes. Um, mainly because, again, and it, it come back, comes back to words as well, because what is the Commonwealth? I mean, this is something which we assume in Britain people know. But there is the Commonwealth of Australia, there's the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Depends where you mention the Commonwealth. So... This, today, we have 56 member countries. 15 of them have Charles III as the king. 36 of them are republics, including Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Singapore, Sri Lanka. And five have another monarch, including Brunei and Malaysia. Big, important body. Population of 2.4 billion people, 94% of whom are in Asia or Africa, including four of the 10 most populous countries in the globe, on the globe. Largest, obviously, is India with 1.4 billion people, or probably, I did this last week, so it's probably 1.5. Um, and the smallest is Tuvalu a country with which I'm sure you're all aware because you will have seen domain names .tv because that economy is based almost entirely on the money they get from the TV, um, whatever it's called, at the end. I rely on my German front bench, <laughs> top-level domain. For characterization, you always have to. Um, so, the Commonwealth. It's not the British Commonwealth, contrary to what Robin Jacobs said at the start this morning. It has, since 1949, been the Commonwealth of Nations. So it's not the British Commonwealth at all. And there are our assumptions that it's all Commonwealth countries, but no. We look at Sri Lanka. Roman Dutch law remains the common law of the country much to my surprise when I did a bit of research, surprisingly for this talk, um, as in South Africa, another member of the Commonwealth. Well, it comes in and out at various points. Um, and the rest are English common law based, except Mozambique, Rwanda, Togo, and Gabon. Members with no previous connection with Great Britain and English common law. So again, one of the assumptions about the Commonwealth blown to pieces. So looking at those, Mozambique, a former Portuguese colony, civil law. Rwanda, a former Belgian trust, after being a district of German East Africa, now based on Belgian German civil law. Togo, annexed by France, an ex-German colony, now based on French civil law. And Gabon, a former French colony, 
where their law is based on French civil law. But I now want to move on from uh, Africa. So the Commonwealth, when Cornish was first published in 1981, 46 members back then, Belize and Antigua and Barbuda. This is great for a geography lesson, actually. Um, many of these countries I'd never heard of before. Not really. But, um, they were new members in 1981. And there had been 14 other new members in the 1970s, although Pakistan withdrew in 1972 as a result of the creation of Bangladesh, um, and they rejoined later in 1989, the year of the second edition of Cornish. Um, and it's quite important again, to know what this thing is, because a lot of the aim of the Commonwealth of Nations, um, Bill approved of, and he spent most of his life trying to bring about, which is to make people understand the, the differences and the commonalities between positions. And at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Singapore in 1971, members had adopted a declaration restating the fact that this is a voluntary and cooperative um, organization and committing the organization to promoting international peace, fighting racism, opposing colonial domination, and reducing inequities in wealth. And, but it's a, it's a voluntary organization. But it does have the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. It also does have a journal which tries to open to people who might not otherwise know about it details of the laws in some of those countries that are otherwise relatively unavailable. A year later, in a year after Cornish was published, the first edition of Cornish, the Maldives joined. And the Maldives left in 2016 and came back four years later. Um, the Commonwealth does not like, um, well, I, I shouldn't say that, actually. I was going to say the Commonwealth does not like um, dictatorships. Um, but, but. Um, so, at the time then that Cornish was published, these were the Asian members. Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, which for obvious reasons departed in 1997. India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and not forgetting the Maldives. And so I want to just quickly look at what is the position in some of these countries that you may not either know where they are or know anything about. And Singapore, which is where I live and have lived since 2010, making regular trips out of it, except for the last three years, um, when I was restrained to a distance of 20 miles by 15 miles for three years, which I didn't think I would ever do, be. Um, so Singapore, very advanced legal system, advanced laws on intellectual property, and very good court system. So I think we've got the hair, there, the Patents Act 1994, based obviously on the UK's Patents Act 1977. Um, and there's frequent reference to both English and European, or EPO, or European Court of Justice um, decisions. Sometimes, in my view, and this is, uh, again, something which Bill was very keen on, comparative law, look, looking at things from a comparative perspective, sometimes in my view slightly misleadingly, because it's one of the problems often with referring to foreign cases, that often if you take a case out of the legal garden in which it has grown and try and impl uh, plant it in another legal system, you've taken it out of a lot of the bedrock on which it relies. And fair use is a good example uh, of that in my view, and all the nonsense that has been spoken about the importance of fair use 
which is why the Australians have rejected uh, introducing a specific fair use defense. But Singapore has recently introduced a general fair use defense in its Copyright Act 2021. Trademarks Act, it's an interesting mishmash of, of laws. Um, it's based on the EU model, more particularly its implementation in the UK in the Trademarks Act 1994, but there are also homegrown provisions. And the courts have departed from um, EU, UK, EU law in it, their interpretation of, tra of uh, trademark law. In particular, and very importantly, they do not have a global appreciation test. They have a strict three-step test, not in copyright, but in trademarks. Similarity of marks, similarity of goods, is there as a result a likelihood of confusion? And what's more, the whole question as to on similarity is, is it more similar than dissimilar? Which leads to some clearly different decisions in Singapore to the UK. Because that has, the case law has developed in such a way that that means that, is it more than 50% similar? Because what can more similar than dissimilar mean other than that? Because the Court of Appeal didn't follow Professor Ng Loi Wee Loon's suggestion, she was an amicus curiae in that case, Singapore Court of Appeal appoints amicus curiae to help it, and she told them that it should be a threshold requirement, similarity, and then you move on to the next, and then the, the real issue is a likelihood of confusion. But they rejected her advice to make it a threshold, and they said, no, it is more similar than dissimilar. And from that have come quite a few problems. Um, the Copyright Act 2021, it's in plain English. Oh dear. <laughs> and lots of words which we recognize have suddenly disappeared to be such as bona fide, bona, bona fide purchaser for value without notice. That is now some odd person called, I think they've got good faith, and I, I, I can't remember how they uh, have reworded it. And there are interesting questions as to whether it is a rewording meant to be a change in the law or not. Um, but there are parts in that Copyright Act which have been taken from Australia, some from the US, some from nowhere, and it's going to be interesting to see how it's interpreted all 514 sections of it. That's in plain English, but not succinct English. <laughs> um, Malaysia, next door, the Trademarks Act 2019, replacing eventually the UK's 1938 Trademarks Act. It also, interestingly, recognizes counterfeiting a registered trademark as a statutory offense. Um, now, whether or not or how that is going to be interpreted and used in Malaysia, we don't yet know, because this has only just come in. India. I'm quickly going around these countries that you may have heard of. Um, India. Since 1981, one can summarize India with one step forward and two steps back very slowly. Um, as those of you who've been involved in IP litigation in India will know, if you don't get an interlocutory injunction or an interim injunction, forget it. You will be in trial in, well, let's say 2042, if you're lucky. There are three million cases pending before the Indian courts. Um, and so that in itself is a problem which intellectual property lawyers have got to grapple with, which is nothing to do with intellectual property law. And in a lot of the countries I'm looking at, there are wonderful laws, but how you enforce those laws is a question of civil procedure, it's a question of all sorts of different things, nothing to do with what people study when they look at intellectual property law. So on that screen, I've got a summary of what is the position in India, one step forward and two steps back. 
very slowly. Pakistan, since 1981, lots of laws, but talking to Pakistani lawyers, little enforcement, or extremely difficult to enforce in that country. Bangladesh, a new country. Um, again, here, we've got the Patents and Designs Act of 1911, still the prevailing law. And a new copyright audience, or, um, ordinance and a trademark act in 2009 that was expanded for the first time to cover services. Sri Lanka. Just before the publication of Cornish, the Code of Intellectual Property Law in 1979 had cut the link with British IP laws. But nothing then happened until 2003 when it was replaced by the Intellectual Property Act of that year, which follows the WIPO model law on trademarks for developing countries. Although with some interesting wording, such as dealing with selvages, borders and edgings as trademarks. What's a selvage? I knew somebody would know. <laughs> yes, I, I had to go and look it up. I, I had done so. Um, but it's also, it reflects the importance of the textile industry in Sri Lanka. And after looking at all these laws, I found uh, in a book about recent developments in Sri Lanka by one of Tanya Aplin's former PhD students that I was looking at recently, a conclusion that Bill Cornish would have agreed with wholeheartedly. And I'm, I apologize for how much I've got on this slide. Reforms to substantive law alone will not suffice to transform Sri Lanka's or any other developing country's IP landscape into a robust, efficient, and user-friendly one, no matter how we define these things. Changes to procedural law are equally important. Suitable tweaks in the approaches to the governance of IP and the system for the resolution of IP disputes are also necessary. Only then will there be a real impact and change. And that's true of many countries in the area in which I live. But Bill Cornish would definitely say, you must look at these th things, I hate this word, but holistically. Thank you very much. While we're waiting, I've got a question for David, which is, why, why is it the legislatures in some of the countries that you, you mentioned have this um, mix and matching approach, even when taking from one legislative source? And the one I've got in mind is the Indian Trademarks Act, which, as you rightly pointed out, is to a large extent based on our 1994 Act, which is in turn based on the original uh, EU um, First harmonization directive. But there's also provisions in there that are left over from the 1938 Act. And what ones why? Um, I think the short answer is often lobbying uh, and also being slightly afraid of getting rid of something unless they're absolutely certain why they're getting rid of it. And that's true, certainly, of some, some regions in the India. <coughs> so, so, they're frightened of the idea of a new code? Yes. 
Hi, Graham. Just to let you know you're being recorded. Hello, Graham. The floor is yours. Thank you, Richard, uh, and thank you, Jane, for setting up the technology. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for allowing me to participate remotely uh, when I was able to travel. I'm sorry I didn't see all of this morning's session. I saw some of them. I understand there was a question in part on the ways in which the SHIP was a general concept of intellectual property, arguably implicit in the uh, organization title of Bill's foundational textbook that's occurred at the international and at the UK levels. Um, interrogating the cohesion of that concept of uh, intellectual property can be performed by considering whether regimes that flood at the edges of the concept can properly be brought um, within the category. Well, one can also explore the utility of the concept by considering whether regimes that are conventionally understood as encompassed by the category represent, represent a cohesive or sensible or common concept and asking about the dynamics are created for treating those regimes as part uh, of a common concept. And I'm really going to address the latter topic uh, from the perspective of, of U.S. law institutions. Uh, reading between the lines of the narrative in the conference uh, brochure or website, I, I take that the conference organizers assume, I think correctly, that the gathering of these regimes together in a single textbook by Bill was a decision more on practical concerns of a pedagogy and pushing educational institutions for teaching the subject rather than an effort to destroy or even quietly stop some sort of jurisprudential revolution. And I suspect the fact that historical contingency and opportunistic choices equally explain some of the subsequent initiatives uh, to evolve, evolve towards or alternatively by other to resist a unified category of the concept of intellectual property. Will those initiatives manifest themselves in the structure of political organizations or the content and scope of substantive legal rules? In the United States, uh, historical contingency also explains efforts to develop or act upon a unified concept or implicitly to treat intellectual property as a coherent concept, so that the doctrines developed under one legal regime naturally uh, jump species, as it were, and transfer over to other regimes. So in my remarks, I'm going to cover three uh, aspects of that conference statement viewed from the US. First, I'm going to talk about one very significant constraint on the development of a general concept of intellectual property. Second, I'm going to mention a couple of forces that appear to create the conditions for the development of that concept. And then third, I'll just very briefly refer to some features of US intellectual property practice, policy, and education that might parallel some of the features mentioned in the brochure for, uh, as indicators of the shift towards the concept of IP in the UK. So let me start with the constraints. And with one variable that's fundamentally different from the United States, and that is the constitutional foundation of protection for the different form of rights that we might subsume under the label of intellectual property. So Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution provides that the Federal Congress shall have power to quote, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing promoted clients, authors, and inventors, to exclude them their respective writings and discoveries. That clause, called day, has been called the intellectual property clause for many years by numerous courts and scholars. And the Supreme Court did so again as recently as 2020 in Alan Cooper, a case involving uh, the Federal Copyright and the Clarification Act. However, clause day is nothing of the sort. It is not an intellectual property clause. It is more properly called the copyright and patent clause. Um, or perhaps, we to the wonderfully hedged title of Bill Cook, the Copyright, Patents, and Allied Rights Clause. Uh, and to be fair, the Supreme Court now, and despite the terminology that they endorsed, they were actually just trying to work out whether the copyright legislation should be treated uh, exactly the same as our patent legislation. Now, my quibble with the common conceptualization of Clause 8 as the IP clause is particularly relevant to trade war law, but it has not found effects with respect to other rights and regimes, as I will explain in a few moments. But let me start with the basis for my quibble. In 1879, the United States Supreme Court decided that trademark cases, not the most creative sobriquet for the cases, but it's a pretty good descriptive one, basically a case involving prosecutions, which had been brought for violation of an 1876 federal statute the criminal law, the fraudulent use of state and benefit of trademarks registered under the Trip Act of 1870. And so that validity of the 1870 Trademark Act, the first federal trademark act in the United States, uh, with the predicate for that criminal prosecution. The Supreme Court struck down the 1870 Act as unconstitutional. 
but it was beyond the scope of congressional legislative authority. Now, the 1870 Act was the type of period of long ago, an act to revise, consolidate, and amend the statute related to patents and copyrights. Not surprisingly, the federal government sought to defend the legislation on the basic clause A, the patent and copyright clause. But that was rejected by the Supreme Court because trademarks differed importantly in kind from copyrights and patents. As the court explained, the ordinary trademark, in quotes, the ordinary trademark has no necessary relation to invention or discovery. The trademark recognized by common law is generally a growth of considerable period of use rather than a sudden invention. If we should endeavor to classify it under the head of writing the authors of the work that was, the objections are equally strong. In this, as in regard to inventions, originality is required. A trademark may be, and generally is, the adoption of something already in existence as a distinctive symbol of the party using it. At common law, this was the right to it for that of its use and not its mere adoption. But we could have further written that if the promotion of science and the useful parts was actually the constitutional part of clause A, then likewise, unlike copyrights and patents, trademarks were not granted to incentivize innovative or original outputs. They were, depending on how one reads the case law at the time, to facilitate trade or to protect consumers against deception. Now, before moving on to the consequences of the decision for our topic, it's worth noting that the court also didn't find the legislation of the 1870 Act justified on its own terms because the statute at the time was not expressly limited to marks used in interstate commerce. The current trademark statute, the Lanham Act, is a legitimate exercise of authority under the Commerce Clause because it is so limited, but not under the copyright and patent law. So why does this matter? Well, most directly, trademark rights can be perpetual. Copyrights and patents cannot. The Commerce Clause does not require that rights be granted for limited times, as copyrights and patents must be because of their grounding in the copyright and patent laws. The Supreme Court has explained for these 70 years that the language of the copyright and patent laws is both an authorization for Congress and a limit on its authority. But there are no contracts beyond the rather uncontroversial duration of distinction between copyright and patent on one hand and trademark on the other. It's commonly accepted that Congress cannot simply circumvent the limits of one clause by invoking the other. So, for example, Congress could not enact perpetual copyright and claim Commerce Clause authority to do so. That is to say, this is the important point, one particular kind of what we now call intellectual property rights is subject to one set of constraints, and a different kind of what we now call intellectual property rights are subject to a different set of constraints. And this occurs because the nature of the rights is different. Now, the interaction of these two differently grounded clauses that jointly underpin the number of rights that we call intellectual property has been of some consequence in context of copyright rights that no cornice would have regarded as allied to copyright, which Ansgar might touch on in the next session. So, in 1991, the Supreme Court denied copyright protection to a white pages telephone directory in the Price case on the grounds that the directory was not original. Because originality could not be established by a sweat of the brow, but instead required a modicum of creativity, which is an alphabetical white pages telephone directory of lacks. And the court held that originality there was not just a statutory set, but also was required by the language of the copyright clause. Absent creativity, Congress had no authority to protect it under the copyright clause. The latter hold, the one that is based on the Constitution, is important for what hold. In the United Kingdom, the EU mandated shifting copyright from a common law originality standard giving weight to labor and skill to the demonstration of an author's own intellectual creation was compensated by the adoption of EU mandated database rights to protect investment. But in the United States, the enactment of parallel legislation, which would have been required to satisfy the reciprocity requirement in the EU legislation, was complicated by the inability of Congress to create rights in non-original databases under the copyright and patent clause. And to ensure that any such rights that the Congress might have granted were not seen simply as circumvention of the limits of the copyright clause, the nature of the scheme that was proposed in several bills in the Congress was that they had to look to the library of competition, which would be less than both under the Congress clause, rather than copyright-like protection, which would have been prohibited by FICE 
for the copyright. Now, whether the U.S. gender-based legislation would have passed muster, we will never know, because the U.S. government decided that traditional rights were not necessary to preserve the dominance of U.S. database providers, something maybe the U.K. Parliament might reflect upon post-Brexit. But Congress did, a couple of years earlier, pass allied rights pursuant to the Commerce Clause. Article 14 of TRIPS required the enactment of performance rights, causing the U.S. in 1995 to enact laws creating civil criminal liability for unauthorized fixation on public signs or images of a live musical performance, the anti bootleg law. These rights were not granted to authors, and the statute that was enacted contains no jurisdictional limit. They are potentially perpetual. Thus, Congress could not accept the next protection pursuant to the copyright clause. But Congress did rely on the Commerce Clause. In a series of cases involving the criminal part of the anti bootleg laws, the constitutionality of the performance rights was challenged by accused bootleggers who were charged with offenses under the provisions. And the courts, in a series of frankly quite incomprehensible judgments, upheld the constitutionality of the statute under the Commerce Clause. For present purposes, there's no need, fortunately, to try to understand what notes they were saying in those opinions. Rather, the key point is that the U.S. Constitution demands that certain rights be structured and treated differently than other types of rights. Yet these are all rights that we would conventionally understand as intellectual property. As a result, the Constitution imposes some essentially unavoidable constraints on the development of a truly unitary concept of intellectual property. Let me turn away from constraints on the development of that type of concept in the U.S. to some of the forces that might push us towards such a concept. In the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on two features, but I think do so. First, the extension in technical subject matter under each of the different intellectual property regimes means that increasingly plaintiffs bring cases with cumulative claims, which are on design and copyright, design and trademark, trademark and copyright, trademark and publicity. And the presence in a single dispute of these overlapping claims makes it tempting for courts to resolve the dispute according to a common consideration and thus to allow doctrines to jump from one regime to another. The Jane Ginsburg has for several years argued that this might happen in the development of fair use doctrines in trademark law that begin to pick up on concepts such as transformativeness that dominate current copyright fair use doctrine, especially in the context of parodic use. And actually, to be fair to Jane, there is actually some evidence of that. But we also recently get this where a defendant's use has been immunized under copyright or trademark law fair use, but not the other. And that is surely a plausible result in the different purposes and foundations of the different bodies of copyright and trademark law as manifested in the constitutional debate I mentioned a moment ago. Indeed, to the extent that courts feel pressured to reach the same result in parallel copyright and trademark claims, while they get a single defendant engaging in parodic use, this arguably doesn't fall from the development of a unitary concept of intellectual property that makes these claims indistinguishable or unitary. Rather, it is because there's a stronger external countervailing consideration, namely the First Amendment and the free speech rights of the defendant, that will define the sphere of permitted use that confines the different copyright and trademark claims to the same common core. And to the extent that different intellectual property regimes expand the scope and increasingly run into these important external countervailing constraints, we might expect more of that type of demand. A second, and to some extent related force that might create the impression of a unitary body of intellectual property law, is the enduring significance of general principles of law. So in 2005, in Hubei and Mark Exchange, the Court of Appeals at the Supreme Court rejected the categorical approach of the Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit. As a general rule, courts issue permanent injunctions against patent infringement absent exceptional circumstances. And they instead stress that the Patent Act, which indicates that injunctive relief may be issued only in accordance with principles of equity, should not result in patent cases being treated differently than other cases where injunctive relief is sought. But given that the same language about principles of equity appears in the provision of the Lanham Act, likewise authorizing injunctive relief, most lower courts post Hubei accepted the relevance of that decision in trademark law. The result was a stiffer challenge for trademark owners seeking injunctive relief, whether permanent or preliminary, against infringers. But the analysis in trademark law should surely have been different. As Mark Lemley has consistently argued, in this context, trademark is different. 
the purpose of the trade world and who it benefits. Should we not just treat trade right injunctions differently than patent and copyright injunctions? The result is a very real risk that courts will work rather than help consumers by allowing you to continue. That difference should have been apparent to any court attentive to the distinction and purpose to which the Supreme Court was alert in 1879. And of course, international law to some extent obliquely recognizes this distinction when it applies to culturalize the same of trade world. Perhaps not a surprise, therefore, that the full effects of the Bay as resistance to trade world law and as a pipeline for courts has been modified by the Trade Act of 2020, which amended the Lanham Act to reincorporate a rebuttable presumption of irreparable harm and make it easy, made it easier to secure injunctive relief in trade world cases um, than in copyright in patent cases. But the work of general principles that were articulated by the Supreme Court in the are overly resilient. And even with the lens of revision, we have seen in the last two years since that law was enacted, a number of courts continue to offer less generous injunctive relief to trade world places than was the case prior to eBay. Uh, I'm going to conclude my remarks on the third topic I said number by noting the US parallel to some of the forces uh, that the conference closure or not in the UK context might have enabled or reflected a shift towards the energy concept of IP. So first, Bill's uh, uh, student book IP and the way it framed how our subject is taught. And the brochure or not, the book was spawned a book of the with all of whom done doggedly with the template for nation provided, of treating patents to operate such parts together. <clears throat> for the United States, the balance of both his books and I would suspect courses, though they have conducted a purposeful study, probably skew more heavily towards treatment of discrete regimes such as copyright patent and trade. To be sure, we still have plenty of what is called intellectual property law, so-called third vehicle rules. But as intellectual property has become more significant, both for legal practice and for the economy, in the 40 years since the publication of Bill's book, the survey courses in the United States are often a vehicle to allow non-specialists to become exposed in some way to its matrix issues as they might come across in practice. Those who are going to a special in the IP are more likely to take the separate courses in each copyright, trademark, and patent, which there are separate books. So the pedagogical use, the usefulness of a collective treatment of the general regime is still why to drive the production of books or courses in IP in the United States, but it's perhaps a different utility, a different usefulness than was the case in 1981 uh, in the United Kingdom. Secondly, the brochure of the conference talks about the political structure and location of the UK IPO. The parallel administrative structure in the US is far less cohesive, at least on the surface. The Patent and Trade Office, which is also has responsibility for design patents, reflects the subject matter of the submission. The Copyright Office is perhaps oddly at first blush, located within the legislative branch and is actually part of the Library of Congress. Perhaps that too makes sense that everyone recognizes the historically greater role of registration and deposit in the United States um, and the development of an international library. But then again, the program this is also in charge of the registration of designs of the shape of bottles, which doesn't really fit that historical system. So, if that is true, so is it really a bit of a mess? And the structure is really explainable only by reference to a number of historical contingencies. But that does not stop U.S. policy in the area from coalescing around the broader concept of intellectual property and the development of an intellectual property community, even if there have been internal turf wars, most notably in the 1990s. The policy circles are simply too intertwined and the lines of demarcation are too porous to make formal administrative budgets independent to the development of horizontal IP policies if that is strategically useful. Just as I would imagine, Bringing together different offices, different regimes in a single individual institution does not of itself ensure cohesion between the forms of IP that needs to be differentiated. That same fragmentation occurs in the United States in the judicial context. We have the Federal Circuit with exclusive appellate jurisdiction in patent cases, and much has been written about whether that institutional choice has arguably shaped the content of patent law. One might think that this institutional claim might possibly cause a diversion attitude to patent and non patent IP cases, but I don't think there's a lot of evidence to bear that out. Of course, the Federal Circuit does hear complicated framework cases, and certainly there are single data points that have shown that the Federal Circuit can be more quite for a way The Google and Oracle copyright speech that went to Supreme Court two years ago, for example, gave rise to two Federal Circuit opinions because there was a patent case uh, in the original complaint brought in the trial court. 
in theory, in those cases, the Federal Circuit applies the law of the circuit on which the case came, the Ninth Circuit, um, uh, which would seem to be more co-dependent than the Federal Circuit in public. Um, I don't know what to make of that. The Federal Circuit's influence in public right cases is quite small. It's greater in trademark cases, because people are also familiar with administrative decisions from the PTO, appeals from those decisions from the PTO to see that. And to be sure, there's some commentator who kind of think the Federal Circuit is too for trademark in those cases. But it's a relatively small issue with the type of issues that they deal with in the larger trademark infringement landscape. I just don't see any great groundswell of alternative judicial attitude developing in copyright and trademark cases on the one hand and patent method on the other as a result of these the appellate jurisdictions of the Federal Circuit being here to find the patent. That just brings me to my final and concluding point, which is why is this, why does it matter whether the same comes to the PI? I say this with great disrespect to the organizers of the conflict victims of the uh, to be sure, it arguably does go to, this, to many models from which to borrow. And the ever growing similarity surely might tempt us to make false assimilations. But treating it as one body of law also facilitates ready contrast and distinction. A homologist can, in the pursuit of great understanding of fruits as a category of study, examine the different subjects of apples and oranges. I don't think that made it harder by recognizing. They're both different types of fruits. Seems it, it may even be made easier. Or to put it less abstractly, let me borrow from Bill's Pyron and Meister's both Isabel and David Lloyd reference to. I'm sure Google would actually much more fun playing with my analogy to Paul Mulligan's, but I'll be serious and instead focus on, on his Pyron and Meister's. Um, in the first chapter, in explaining the scope of his subject, Bill explained that it might be today a generic title for patents, copyrights, trademarks, because of any registration, etc., and so forth. He endorsed a relaxed scholarly attitude to collective labor, noting as helpful, property law scholarship, but likewise, very coolly, he said, recognized the very other rights for which we use the property labor. As Bill concluded, intellectual property may not be a convenient genus, but its very species remain the same. Indeed, he said one of his aims, was to stress the differences between them, noting how their objectives differ and accordingly their legal construction and their intellectual impact would as well. These words are as true today, whether in the UK or in the US, as when Bill delivered. Thank you.